Welcome to Your Gal Friday, a podcast about female leaders, innovators, and rule breakers. Each week, your hosts will shine a spotlight on an amazing gal and talk about what we can all learn from her. Brought to you by Gal's Guide to the Galaxy. Welcome to Your Gal Friday. I am Dr. Leah Leach. And I'm Phoebe Freer. Today, we are talking about a gal who is a poet, an activist, a dancer, an actress, a director, a writer, and an educator. Today, we're talking about the amazing life and legacy of your gal, Maya Angelou. Oh my goodness, I am so excited for this week. Lee and I both watched the documentary Maya Angelou and Still I Rise, and that's on Netflix in case you're curious. It's about two hours long. We learned a lot and our podcast is obviously shorter than two hours, so we're trying to fit a lot into a l- short amount of time, but you can always learn more from documentaries and such. Um, it's a wonderful watch. It was a really good documentary. It was so good. I loved it. It was so good. I cried at least four times. I'm not even kidding. Um, <laughs> but mm-hmm. it's really, it was really cool. Me too. Cool. Me too. Yeah, no, seriously, I cried so much, but in all good ways and like, it's just so raw and real and yeah, it's really great. In the in the documentary, they did address about people calling her Maya, people calling her Miss Angelo. So I'm probably going to go back and forth calling her both things, just out of respect, out of per- like keeping it personal and that kind of thing. If that's cool, totally do what you gotta do. <laughs> Sweet. All right. So Maya was born as Marguerite Annie Johnson on April fourth of nineteen twenty eight in St. Louis, Missouri. She grew up with her older brother named Bailey Johnson Jr. Her brother nicknamed Marguerite Maya, which was derived from my or Maya sister, which to me is it's just so sweet. I have one older brother. It's very sweet. Yeah. And like I I I kind of understand that bond, that that sibling bond. Absolutely. Yep, I have a younger brother. I have a baby brother too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so they were very close growing up, and they almost had to be, seeing as their childhoods weren't really the easiest. Now, when Miss Angelou was only four years old, her mother sent her and her brother away. In the documentary, um, it says that she thought of her mother as dead for a while because of the pain of thinking that she was rejected. It, it, the, it was just too much. Now, she and her brother missed her dearly. Now, during this time, their parents divorced and found different paths. Maya and Bailey lived with their grandmother in Stamps, Arkansas. This town really, really affected her life, and it turns out it was not really far away from where President Bill Clinton grew up, too, which we will get into much later in this show, but I thought it was worth mentioning. Now, four years later, the children were taken back to her mother's house in St. Louis. Now, by this point, Maya's mother had a new boyfriend. Now, this is the part of the story where it kind of gets, like, shady for me. It's kind of hard. Um, This boyfriend actually raped Miss Angelou at the age of eight years old. She told her brother Bailey, who then told the rest of her family. Now, this man was found guilty and sent to jail, but it was for exactly one day and one night. Now, when he Mm. was released, the man was murdered, and they say the the cause of death was that he was kicked to death. It was thought to be by Maya's uncles or family members who, uh who killed him now after that maya went mute for five years straight she said she was worried that her voice had killed a man which now that we we know maya today and all of the words that impacted our world and societies today it's kind of hard to imagine her being quiet but it's what she did for five years Right. That was her therapy. That was her uh, Mm. repentance. That was her working it out in any way, shape or form. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's a lot to work out as a young child. It is. That's a lot of if you're internalizing that as guilt. That's Mm. a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Now, she blamed his death on herself. And it's a lot for a child to carry. Now, shortly after the incident, the kids were sent back to live with their grandmother in Stamps, Arkansas. Now, in those five years of being mute, she actually learned how to listen. She even said that she imagined her whole body like an ear. She took in all the information that she could. She read from all the famous authors and poets. She memorized entire Shakespeare's plays and Edgar Allan Poe works. And she was a very, very bright young lady. She said herself in the documentary that out of the darkness, there came a good thing. She learned so much in those five years. 
She was a very bright young lady. Now, Maya had a teacher by the name of Mrs. Bertha Flowers who showed her a lot of literature. She said that she wrote poetry, and Miss Angelou's teacher wanted her to hear some of her work. Now, Maya tried to show her on this pad, but her teacher said, You can never love the word or poetry unless you hear it spoken from your own tongue. And so Maya started to speak again. Now, when Maya was 14, her and her brother again moved back in with her mother, who had moved by now to Oakland, California. Now, at this time, Maya attended the California Labor School at the age of 16. Now, she became the first black female cable car conductor in San Francisco, and she got a Lifetime Achievement Award later on for this. She dropped out of school for a time, but then went back. And then when she was 16, she met a boy, and they slept together, and she became pregnant with her son, Guy. Now, her mother asked her if she loved the boy. She said no. She asked if the boy loved her. Again, Maya said no. Her mother, quote, didn't want to ruin three lives, and so she didn't give Maya a tough time about this. Instead, she supported her and her new son. Now, Maya graduated high school two weeks before Guy was born. When she was 16, she moved out and took on si single parenting on her own. That is a lot for a 16-year-old. Like, that that was an action-packed segment right there. <laughs> Right. Absolutely. Yeah. There was a lot that, that she did and that happened to her just by the age of 16. Imagine what yeah. the rest of her life will be. Right. <laughs> it doesn't slow down. It, it, it doesn't only slow down. Guys. <laughs> yeah, it just. Yeah, exactly. Tell us more, Leah. Well, in 1952, Maya married a Greek sailor and an inspiring musician, Tosh Angela, see, I'm very bad at Greek names, so I will probably oh, really, Angel. really murder this name. But it's Tosh Angelopoulos is what I'm going to go for. <laughs> and I apologize. Okay. Angelopoulos? Quite possible. Angelopoulos. Yeah, you'd say it fast and it'll sound better. <laughs> right. <laughs> but even though the marriage was short-lived, this is actually where the Angelou part of her professional name comes from. Uh -huh. uh, so throughout the 1950s, Maya and her son moved around a lot to follow job opportunities. Maya took a modern dance class in San Francisco, and she studied African dance in New York. She was a performer at the Purple Onion nightclub, and the Purple Onion uh, was actually actually part of the beat poet scene but it's also uh it was a comedy club where phyllis diller made her debut as well wow so in the documentary that phoebe was talking about and still i rise maya talks about when she saw that she would get paid more if she was a singer than a dancer like a lot more so she started singing a lot more <laughs> I now, Calypso yeah. was actually her calling card. She had a very tall frame, long legs, and this unique, deep voice. And it really lent itself to the rhythmic and harmic vocals. So when the opera Porgy and Bess came to San Francisco looking for dancers, my auditioned. Porgy and Bess was a novel that was turned into a play that was turned into an opera. Uh, and it starred African Americans. Now, Maya landed the role of Clara, and it took her all over the world for many years. As the fantastic as it was for the exposure to worldviews, to new languages, to celebrity friends, to steady work, and to building a career, she wasn't with her son. The separation was not easy. So when Maya returned, she strived to land a play in New York, and that would allow her to have steady work and to stay home with her son. A starring role, a supporting role, an understudy, it did not matter. She wanted the work. But after heartbreaks, she was back on the road earning a living. Now, Calypso yeah. was paying the bills, and it was keeping the work coming. So Maya was in an off-Broadway review that not only featured Calypso, but it also inspired the 1957 film Calypso Heat Wave, in which Maya was cast as herself, which oh I love gosh. that. Herself. That is so great. Herself. <laughs> she has more exactly. credits on IMDb as herself than anything else combined. Yeah. I yep. love that. Yep. <laughs> Maya also followed that up by recording her first album titled Miss Calypso. So she oh, even had an album. <laughs> Man. Well, on the road, she started writing. Uh, she hoped that perhaps writing would give her career more control. Maybe she would be able to find a way to stay at home more. So she joined the Harlem Writers Guild. Now, the Harlem Writers Guild was established in 1950, and the group was designed for constructive criticism of each other's work, but it also included 
quote, vigorous discussions on the state of black affairs, end quote. So the Harlem Writers Guild website describes Maya's involvement as a powerful, prolific, and passionate member. So as a newly established writer in the 1960s donned big changes, not only for Maya, but a lot of African Americans, right, Phoebe? So absolutely. You know the name of Martin Luther King Jr., right? I mean, we have heard of him a few times. (laughs) I mean, we only have a whole day in America devoted to him, but you know, not a big deal. (laughs) (laughs) He's awesome. (laughs) He he's awesome. He is awesome. Yeah. So Maya met him actually in nineteen sixty after hearing him speak. Now, alternatively, after seeing Maya's work through the Harlem Writers Guild. Martin Luther King was impressed with Maya, and she was named the Southern Christian Leader Conference's Northern Coordinator at the request of Martin Luther King Jr. That is a bit of a mouthful, but it's pretty awesome. (laughs) It's pretty awesome. It's pretty great. But she did not stop there. Maya was a performer, as we know, but she also acted in a historic off-Broadway production of Jean Janet's play called The Blacks. Now, The Blacks was a play within a play with a powerful message on racial prejudice that featured all actors who were people of color. But it was about this interracial war, almost, with Blacks playing whites using these white and elaborate, almost ball masks. They were reenacting this trial, and they say in the documentary that um, the whites were put, like, on a pedestal on a higher part of the stage and as it as the play went on they they went lower and then the blacks went higher it was this really interesting dynamic and it makes me really want to watch the play so i can understand more yeah absolutely it looks intense and awesome and intellectual and yeah i love it absolutely now maya actually played the white queen and it was an interesting counterbalance of the strong black female playing this white queen now people said that there were strong reaction to this play including a person fainting people walking out i think somebody had a heart attack or something i'm not quite sure but etc like it was a strong reaction it got serious the audience. it got real oh yeah, yeah. Now, among the original cast was also James Earl Jones, who happens to be one of my favorite all-time actors as well, so I had to give a little shout-out to him. Um, Yeah. Oh, it looks like an amazing work. Right? Now, while in New York, Maya fell in love with the South African civil rights activist, and I'm going to mess up his name and I apologize, but it's Vismuzi Make. Now, they shared a passion for human rights and for fighting what they believed in, and they married. Now, in 1960, the couple moved with her side with her son Guy, to Cairo, Egypt. Now, in Cairo, she did this because she really was discovering her African roots. She wanted to dig Mm -hmm. deep into her heritage, which I completely respect and fall in love with. Like, it's amazing. I love that, yeah. Um, Now, while she was in Cairo, Maya served as an editor of the English Language Weekly, The Arab Observer. She was drawn to her African roots and wanted to dig deeper, learn her culture and heritage firsthand, which is really cool and relatable. Now, Maya and Guy later moved to Ghana, Africa. Now, Maya was originally going to move to a different part of the continent once Guy was settled in school in Ghana. But on the first day they were there, he got into a bad car accident. Now, it was so bad, like, he was hurt so bad that the doctor said he, if he had just sneezed, it would have snapped his neck. He was that close to death. Now, he had to stay in a large cast for three months, and his mother stayed by his side. She was devastated and heartbroken for her son, and it it completely derailed what she was going to do next. But, on the other hand, she was not unhappy by the community that she found in Ghana. She actually joined a thriving group of African Americans in Ghana, and she served as an instructor and assistant administrator at the University of Ghana School of Music and Drama. She worked as feature editor for the African Review and wrote for the Ghanaian Times with the Ghanaian Broadcasting Company. She was welcomed by the community, she learned about their culture and heritage and style, and she grew to love it. They really taught her how to sing, how to dance, she observed the children, like she learned so much in Ghana that she didn't even realize. She made a bad situation really positive and really inspirational. 
Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Well, in 1964, Malcolm X announced his break from the Nation of Islam, and he went on a spiritual pilgrimage to explore as much of Africa as possible. And one of those stops was to see Maya in Guyana. Uh, Now, I can't do proper justice uh, to Malcolm X in a soundbite. It's like really, really hard. (laughs) Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, Sorry. I think that Malcolm X is a journey that every teenager uh, should learn about. And if you are past your teenage years, it is not too late to learn about Brother Malcolm. So I believe that everybody should learn about Brother Malcolm. (laughs) Oh, absolutely. Um, I... I highly suggest Spike Lee's uh, film, Malcolm X. Um, I also recommend the book, The Autobiography of Malcolm X, as told by Alex Haley. Those are the two that I I really, really recommend. Um, However, the quick version is, or the refresher, if you will, um, Malcolm was a civil rights leader who is kind of the yang to Martin Luther King Jr.'s yin. You know what I mean? You get the yin and the yang. You get both sides of it. They were both fighting for the same thing, but they just had different energy surrounding them. All right. is kind of what it is. Malcolm condemned not only white politicians, but all white men calling them white devils. And he challenged. Oh, yeah. He he went extreme with it. uh, And he would challenge Martin Luther King's stance on nonviolence to one of self-defense. Malcolm very much believed that the white man was the oppressor who was actively trying to kill his people and he was going to arm himself. But Mm -hmm. here's the thing. When Malcolm went on his spiritual quest to find his African roots, he journeyed to Mecca to complete the Hajj. And he wrote this back to his followers, quote, there were tens of thousands of pilgrims from all over the world. They were of all colors, from blue eyed blondes to black skinned Africans. But we were all participating in the same ritual, displaying the spirit of unity and brotherhood that makes my experiences in America that had led me to believe that we could never exist between white and non-white. So through his journey throughout Africa, it caused him to change his mind. Oh, wow. And that's incredible. Uh, He then wrote, quote, I'm not a racist. In the past, I permitted myself to be used to make sweeping indictments of all white people, the entire white race. And these generalizations have caused injuries to some whites who perhaps did not deserve to be hurt. But because of my spiritual enlightenment, which I was blessed to receive at the result of my recent pilgrimage to the holy city of Mecca, I no longer subscribe to the sweeping indictments of any one race. I am now striving to live the life of a true Sunni Muslim. I must repeat that I am not a racist, nor do I subscribe to the tenets of racism. I can state in all sincerity that I wish nothing but freedom, justice, and equality, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for all people. Now, Maya was taken by Malcolm's courage to change his mind. And she was so taken with it that she moved to New York to help with his new organization, the Organization of Afro-American Unity. On February 21st, 1965, however, Malcolm took the stage to address the membership in New York when he was shot and killed. Maya was devastated. Uh, She turned to writing and confiding in her good friend, James Baldwin, to see her through. It would be three years later, and with a few plays under her belt that she had produced, a song that she wrote for B.B. King, which was produced by Quincy Jones for the movie For the Love of Ivory, Maya was ready to come back to the civil rights movement. When Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. asked her to return and to organize a march, and she agreed. However, on April 4th, 1968, Maya's birthday, Martin Luther King Jr. was shot at the Lorraine Hotel. She says in the documentary, it knocked me out and I I fell into my mutism again. So it wasn't easy on her, understandably so. Uh, James Baldwin came to the rescue again. He got her out of it. He got her talking. He got her writing. And he got her talking about her childhood. And that is a very interesting transition to then what you were looking at for Maya's life. It really is. And it's it's fascinating to me that the thing that turned her to mutism the first time is kind of almost what got her out of it the second time. Extreme sadness. Yeah. Yeah, and absolutely. Did she, was she feeling guilt? I hope she wasn't feeling any guilt. You know <sighs> what I'm saying? Question. It's a good question, but like... 
me stepping into her shoes like I would like not I would feel guilty to. but there I would that's I, not justifiable right it's yeah. not and that's why having such good friends like James Baldwin there to like correct your brain and be like no listen this is not yours to carry you know I can just imagine right. the types of talking that he was like the type the types of things he was telling her like no this is not right yours to exactly carry. you you don't need to feel guilty there are just bad people pa- bad people do bad things and it's not your fault that kind of thing you know right but, like, we need to yeah we move on we grow from this you know what i mean absolutely. we evolve we we work past it we do the hard work and we just keep going yeah yep, absolutely absolutely and he was smart into turning her into her creativity and back into her writing because she yes. was still in mourning, and Maya again dives into something new. She stars, writes, and produces a 10 part documentary called Blacks, Blues, Blacks. Now, in this documentary, she shares the wealth of knowledge she learned while in Africa. Now, I started watching this last night, and I took all my took all my strength to stop watching it because <laughs> it was so fun. <laughs> it was so fun to watch. I, I just found the first episode on YouTube, and it's like, oh, this is dangerous. All right. But, is binge worthy. Um, yeah, there you it go. It really <laughs> is. It really is. It's binge worthy. I was like, I don't have time for this. Ah. Um, but no, it's really fun to watch, actually. She talks about comparing African culture to African American culture. She starts the series by saying that without African trade, free or not free, legal or illegal, the world would, as she says, have a different face. For example, she introduces the game Jax as first an african game she said that they have lots of rubber but sometimes the jacks themselves would be stones but it's still the same game uh the hokey pokey Ah. for example was derived from africa certain dance moves etc it was really cool to watch because she actually had two dancers dancing the african uh, version and the african-american version of each dance it's just mesmerizing to watch And uh, seeing her passion about it, too, you can tell she really knows what she's saying. She's done her research and she's really excited about it. And it's just really fun. Yeah, I love that. And it's really cool because like I I'm want to compare and contrast different religions in the same way. So it's like, okay, I definitely need to binge through this and see how she did it. Because like this is a similar thing to what I want to do in the future. So that's pretty awesome. Yeah, absolutely. So also through this time in 1969, Maya wrote the infamous I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings. Now, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings is the first in a seven-volume series of books that she wrote about her own life. Maya was challenged by her friend and author James Baldwin and her editor, Robert Loomis, to write an autobiography that was also a piece of literature. She talks about her past in great detail. She talks about identity. I'm sure it helped as a coping mechanism, actually. I know writing helps me in that way to help figure out who I am and where I stand. In the book, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings was nominated for the National Book Award in 1970 and remained on the New York Times paperback bestseller list for two years. It has been used in educational settings from high schools to universities, and the book has been celebrated for creating new literary avenues for the American memoir. However, the book's graphic depiction of childhood rape, racism, and sexuality has caused it to be challenged or banned in some schools and libraries. But not our library, right, Leah? (laughs) Absolutely not. We welcome all women's books, memoirs, autobiographies, uh, biographies. Absolutely. I love it. A story (laughs) is a story. Yes. Absolutely. (laughs) Perfect. Well, with her first autobiography on the scene, uh, Maya was on the rise. She followed up with her first book of poetry, Just Give Me a Cool Drink of Water Before I Die. In 1972, the film Georgia, Georgia was released. According to IMDb, it's the first film with an original screenplay by a black woman to be produced Mm. in the United States, right? Yeah, Yeah, that's cool. Also, 1972, what took so long? Okay. (laughs) 
<laughs> I know, right? 1970. I feel like that's the theme this this season. What took so long, America? What, what took, took so, so long? long? <laughs> I know, exactly. Really? My goodness, we are slow. Uh, yeah. But my Angelou also wrote the film soundtrack, which I found very interesting mm. um, by counter, you know, by helping out with the music too. So in 1973, Maya married Paul Defer, a writer and construction worker. Paul was previously married to feminist Arthur Jermaine Greer. So a lot of times people think his writing is either about Maya or about Jermaine. And there's always this kind of mystery of who was he writing about? Uh, Now, it would be Maya's second interracial marriage. And Maya was very secretive for a while about her marriages, especially her interracial ones. Um, But usually it was a conversation with uh, James Baldwin that would allow her to value her heart and her happiness, uh, and to marry. <laughs> now, Aww. according to the, her friends in the documentary, and Still I Rise, Maya seemed to be in love and at peace, and the couple fixed up a house, and the marriage would last eight years. Aww. Now, in the mid-1970s, saw the release of Maya's second and third autobiographies. Following the events of I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, she published Gather Together in My Name, and Singing and Swinging and Getting Merry Like Christmas, And it continued Maya's life into her 20s. Now, in 1977, that was the year that many Americans were glued to their televisions for the must-see event miniseries of Roots. Maya Angelou played Kuta Kinte's grandmother in this powerful adaptation of Alex Haley's book about a family line from slavery to liberation. It's a fantastic series. There's a 77 version, and there is a reimagining that happened not too long ago. I highly recommend Mm -hmm. both but I would say 77 start there (laughs) please do that Uh, following her appearance in Roots was her work on And Still I Rise it was a famous poem in 1976 it was also a play and it was also her third book of poetry so we hear And Still I Rise as the title of lots of different um, Maya Angelou projects Uh, but its heart is from a poem that she wrote which is a fantastic poem uh this is actually where i personally was first introduced to dr angelou it was her reading the poem on television and it inspired me to get a book of her poetry and to learn more about her so i highly recommend uh looking on youtube or looking on the internet to hear in Maya's own words, reading uh, And Still I Rise as poetry. Trust me, you will thank me. It is beautiful. And we will have a link in the show notes as well at galsguide.org just to make it even easier to hear this beautiful, beautiful poem. (laughs) Oh, yeah, it's so great. So to end out the 1970s, which was one of the more (laughs) prolific writing times of her life, was the TV movie version of I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings. And it starred Diane Carroll, and it had Esther Roll in it. So she also, at this time, met TV anchor from Baltimore, Maryland. What was her name? Oprah Winfrey? Oh, oh, Oprah, just Oprah. Interesting. (laughs) So that's when the two of them met. Huh. Who would have thought? (laughs) Right. (laughs) Inspiration and motivation and mentorship and, yeah, exactly. Education. It just Yes, it blossoms. It's perfect. (laughs) It's so great. It's so good. Now, um, Maya continued to write, um, and she wrote The Heart of a Woman, which recounts events from Maya's life between 1957 and 1962. And it follows her travels to California, New York City, Cairo, Ghana, and sh- and how she raises Guy, who was a teen by then. How she becomes a published author, becomes active in civil rights movements, and becomes romantically involved with the South African anti-apartheid fighter. Now, one of the most important themes of The Heart of a Woman is motherhood. As Maya continues to raise her son, the book ends with her son leaving for college and Maya looking forward to newfound independence and freedom. Now, this book sounds very fascinating to me, and my I may have to read it just out of context, just without the rest of them in the future, because I'm very Skipping curious. around. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like, I'm very curious about this specific part of her life, but going back to her roots... Um, seeing as I want to go back to my roots as well, I want to travel the world, I want to raise a family eventually and do all this stuff. And that's kind of, I guess, the part of my life that I'm in. So it's like, okay, how did this like really influential woman 
achieve this you know so i think that's really cool and i think that's some of the the part of the magic of her having mm-hmm. so many different autobiographies so someone would be like oh, oh but there's gosh, seven yeah. yeah but you know what there are different phases of our lives maybe yeah. there's seven different phases of our lives and yeah. so you know this particular phase that she wrote about in heart of woman is the particular phase that you are in right now so Absolutely. like it makes sense that way it's like yeah yeah <laughs> and it's really cool like it's really inspiring to me cuz I'm a writer too and I've like often thought about writing about my life but I'm like I'm 24. Uh, I still have a lot to say but like I'm not done yet you know so but it's cool. Right, yeah. It's like okay maybe I do write and I'm not nearly even close to as fascinating as my Angelou don't get me wrong but like <laughs> oh my gosh but it's like okay there I don't know I related to her on so on different levels that I'd really right. didn't expect. It's- It's a path. It's an inspiration. It's a file that away and be like, well, maybe. Exactly. (laughs) Like, I feel like I've been searching so long for different types of role models. And I found one in Yulia and I found, I find role models in um, different gals that we research. But like Maya is like, okay, wow, this is like a like a template almost like okay this is right cool. exactly like, <laughs> yeah hitting stronger than others absolutely yeah it's super cool now i did a little bit of research and not a lot is said about miss angelou's time teaching at wake forest um university which is pretty strange seeing as on the wake forest university website it says that she taught there for 32 years so right. i think that's i mean like Okay, I guess her books and poems are just stand out more or something. Like, but it was weird. I had to look at the Wake Forest University website to even find that. So I'm like, okay, come on, guys. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's super weird. But anyways, um, she first went to Wake Forest in 1973 for a speaking engagement and was starting what would become a long relationship with the university. She was named the university's first Reynolds Professor of American Studies in 1982. Now, Wake Forest awarded Miss Angelou an honorary degree in 1977. In 2002, the Wake Forest School of Medicine created the Maya Angelou Center for Health Equity and to study racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare and health outcomes. Oh my goodness! Very nice. So many Look things. Look at that. <laughs> All right. Now, it, <laughs> it was cool because um, what they did say was like Maya actually found her love for teaching. She did say this yeah. in her documentary about how she did not realize it, but she loved being a teacher, not just writing about her experience, not just being creating art, but actually teaching children and teaching youth how to how to approach life and how to, you know, approach themselves and be stronger in themselves. And uh, that's just super cool. Right. Absolutely. I totally see it. Yeah, absolutely. Miss Angelou went on to write her fifth autobiography at this time called All God's Children Need Traveling Shoes. Now, it sets between 1962 and 65. The book begins where she is 33 years old and recounts the year she lived in Ghana. Now, the book deriving its title from Negro Spirituals begins where her previous memoir ends. Um, and it begins with a traumatic car accident involving her son, Guy, and it closes with returning to America. So that would be a pretty cool one to read as yeah. well. Absolutely. Super cool. And, like, dealing with all of that stress with her son. Like, you could tell just by the way she talked about her son in the documentary how much she adores him. Like, it's so Oh, prevalent. absolutely. And was scared, just absolutely she, terrified oh, she was going to yeah. lose him. Mm-hmm. Oh absolutely. my goodness. I don't yep. I don't wish that on anybody. My goodness no. gracious. Absolutely not. The 1990s saw Maya on two film sets and on the national stage with the president of the United States. So Mm -hmm. first, the film set. Now, John Singleton was following up his acclaimed film, Boys in the Hood, with a film about a young poet named Justice. And John asked Maya if she would write some poetry for Janet Jackson's characters to say in the film, Poetic Justice. So Maya Angelou agreed, and John extended the invitation to have her have a cameo in the film and she agreed now i know so now i'm going to paraphrase this story because i've heard it uh i've heard it a few times and i've heard it a few variations a few different ways (laughs) so uh so i'm just gonna variation and also it's always better when she tells it okay it's always Always, better when she tells it okay 
Uh, but for the sake of a podcast, I'm going to do my best and then I'm going to link uh, to the different versions. Maya Angelou was on the set of Poetic Justice and there was two men that were having like a war of words, basically. It was starting to get yeah. very heated. Uh, one may have even been grabbing the other one, you know what I mean? In a very fisticuffs like mm-hmm. fashion. Um, right. If it was <laughs> the early 1800s, these two were about to have a duel was basically what it seemed right, like, yeah, right? Uh, absolutely, um, yeah. Now, one young man on the set was just cursing up a storm and Maya pulled him aside to talk to him and she's like hey can I talk to you and he's like and he's, she's like I know I know <laughs> and yeah. she's trying to get him to kind of calm down and also the language just a little bit um, but she talked to this young black man about how special he was about mm-hmm. how important he was and she talked to him about how their people stood on auction blocks and how they were bought and sold and she talked to him about how many hardships their ancestors went through just so he could exist mm-hmm. now she had no idea of who he was but she told him he was important because his family had strength and because of his family strength he was important and the young man started crying and Maya wipes his tears and hugs him and they return back to the set and she goes to her trailer take a minute she goes into her trailer Janet Jackson rushes to the door <laughs> mm-hmm. pounding on the door saying Dr. Angelou I can't believe that you just talked to Tupac Shakur <laughs> <laughs> And Maya oh, always man. responds, don't know six pack. <laughs> <laughs> Tupac's mother actually wrote Maya a letter thanking her. And she even said uh, in one interview that Tupac's mother believed that Maya Angelou saved his life that particular day because the fight could have gotten really wow. ugly. Now, Maya's advice right. and encouragement to a rapper is one thing. But in 1993, she actually took the stage to deliver a new poem at the inauguration of President Bill Clinton. The poem, quote, Mm -hmm. on the pulse of the morning was basically like pulling all of America aside for a second. (laughs) Kind of like she did with Tupac. That's definitely a moment where I Right, exactly. So Mm -hmm. she pulls us to a side and she she talks about inclusion and she talks about responsibility. Um, Maya was the second only poet in history to read a poem at a presidential inauguration. Uh, The first was Robert Frost Mm -hmm. at John F. Kennedy's inauguration. Uh, There was an audio recording of the poem and it won a Grammy award for best spoken word oh my yeah gosh. right grammys <laughs> oh my gosh i just swore i'm sorry but wow yeah. oh my gosh so in 1998 saw maya in the director's seat a film director so the oh yes. the film oh, yes. down yes. in the so delta <laughs> oh yes i love it <laughs> the film down in the delta was directed by maya and it starred alfrey woodard mary alice and wesley snipes and it's the story of a mother bringing her now full-grown daughter back to the south to learn her history and connect with family and it's a wonderful watch um but i mean i would say especially in september because that's directed by women month however it's good to watch anytime <laughs> oh so yeah. yes the director's seat how about that oh yeah i believe she was also she starred in a couple movies as well yes the making of the american quilt is one that's where she met uh i think it's where she met one of her friends who was in the documentary yeah i, that's why I, I think alfrey woodard's in that i mostly i saw it because uh winona writer was mm-hmm. in it and i was a very big winona writer fan so how to make an american uh, quilt plus yeah. it's also just really really good that's where i always say that um you know family and mentors and knowing like you know people of history is like a patchwork quilt it comes from that movie it's the idea of it's all woven together we put pieces together it comes yeah. from that movie so absolutely yeah. so also in 2000 she created a successful collection of products for hallmark including greeting cards decorative household items cards and candles and uh they used quotes like murmur sweet words softly in the evening breeze or true friendship adds years to life now, critics kind of blew up on this. They were like, oh, whoa, you're, you're getting mainstream. Like, what's happening? And she responded to these critics um, by stating that the Enterprise was perfectly in keeping with her role as the people's poet. Absolutely. So I bought she, cards with had her quotes on yes. it. I loved them. I thought it was fantastic. Um, 
I absolutely. I was looking up different things. I was like, oh, I would buy that, and I would buy that, and I was like, yep, no, that makes sense. Like, of course she's on Hallmark. Come on, exactly. guys. Exactly. <laughs> I thought it was a perfect fit. I like, absolutely loved smart. it. Exactly. Yeah. Now, more than 30 years after Maya began writing her life story, she completed her sixth autobiography, A Song Flung Up to Heaven, in 2002. Now, this book, she talks about Malcolm X and MLK and how she dealt with her the tragic losses. The book ends with her, quote, at the threshold of my career. Ah, look at that. So that one sounds like it would be my absolute favorite. <laughs> yeah. Because it's... Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, oh, man. But, well, I think it would be hard. I Like, it would, it would take me a bit to get there, though, because I'm like, ah, oh, I don't want to deal with those deaths, though. Like, I don't want to... I don't want to go through that yet. I know. Like, I am that... You know what I, I mean? I am that like, person that's from the, the darkest of the dark comes the lightest of the light. You know what I mean? Right. Um, yeah, so, absolutely. I mean, I sound like, ooh, I'm super excited to read about tragedy. But the reason why I'm super excited about it is because when you are experiencing that much loss and you feel like you know that hope is gone how you get yourself out of it is nothing sort of a miracle so I I bet you there's just like just gems of wisdom you know scattered throughout that one yeah so yeah well in 2010 Maya would publish a second cookbook and a few years later she would publish her final book of poetry as well as her seventh autobiography entitled mom and me and mom. Over her lifetime, Dr. Maya Angelou published 36 books. Can you believe that? 36. Oh my right? gosh. I was looking at her website and it just kept going. Like I kept, like they have this thing of all of her books and it they just They scroll. Going, yeah, they going. scroll like, across. Oh she wrote gosh, children's books scroll. as well. She did. I'm like, I have so much catching up. Yeah. Oh my gosh. The yeah. part that was, uh, that was intense for me and I also related to it at the same time is a lot of her books she wrote on yellow legal pads. Um, so handwritten. Mm-hmm. She would start them handwritten. Um, right. And she would kind of like, uh, you know, get a room at a hotel uh, to kind of sequester herself and get pages done and longhand mm-hmm. and just really work it. Um, and I, I found that commendable and just, you know, oh my goodness, tiring at the same time. <laughs> it's like, do what Absolutely, you got to do. Yeah. Whatever your process is, you do it. But right. wow. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, Maya struggled with COPD as she got older and breathing became more difficult, but she spoke to awaiting crowds anytime she could. There's also a lovely Iconoclast episode that was later in her life, and I'll put a link to it in the show notes. And it's where she spoke with Dave Chappelle. Um, I highly recommend that one. And it's the two of them kind of sharing their mm. their wisdom of life. Uh, it's really, really good. On May 28th of 2014, she left this mortal plane. She was 86 years old and lived a remarkable life, and that feels like an understatement. It really does. Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Tributes were poured in from around the world. She was given many memorial services where the community and family came to talk about her many gifts to the world. Her book, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sing, rose to number one once again on Amazon's bestseller list. Yeah, I know. So this is really tough because she did do a lot of things. And I think that's remarkable. Mm -hmm. But what do you think her legacy is that she wanted to leave behind? What do you think she was doing all these things um, to be remembered for? It is a tough question. I mean, this is Maya Angelou. Right. But (laughs) but um, I think in a way, maybe this is just where I'm standing right now, but maybe in a way she still saw the racial inequality and she wanted to fight back in her own way. And I think that her legacy would be that she wanted to leave behind a more peaceful world where we're more inclusive and more respectful and of all races and all genders. And, you know, that's something that she, she specifically has said. Um, and I really think that that that's like her main goal in life and to like to encourage young people right. to be more respectful and more inclusive and to be more passionate about what they do as opposed to just being mad and angry and not doing anything about it, but just stewing and just going on with life like she wanted people to get up and stand and create art and live in unity and. That's kind of what stands out to me. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm I'm there with you. Uh, it was it is a struggle when you find such a diverse life. You know what I mean? Like everybody lives a full life. Um, everybody lives a unique Absolutely. life. But this was uh, so many different aspects. It was just diverse in what she learned and what she gave. So it's kind of like what she soaked right. in and what she put out um, was so varied that it's wonderful. Um, but a lot of times right. with legacy, they want to put you, uh, you know, in a box or with a label. And so that makes it a little bit more difficult mm -hmm. <laughs> if you're good at lots right. of different things. Um, the statement her family said on the day of her death was that Maya Angelou was quote, a warrior of equality, tolerance, and peace. That is what her family said mm -hmm. of her legacy. Um, Maya said this about herself. She said, quote, I have learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And I loved that mm -hmm. because I see that in a variety of different ways. And so I think her amazing legacy is that she used her voice to lift us up and kind of like shake us off and then give us those perfect words, you know, like when you know better, you do better or you are enough mm -hmm. uh, or I rise, you know, uh, she then like kind of like mm -hmm. pops us on the butt. And she sets us back into the world. You know what I mean? Like, all right, now go get him, kid. You know, like that's absolutely. what she do. <laughs> right. <Yep. laughs> absolutely. It's, you know, it's a little firm. <laughs> it's a little, you better do better right. now. Uh, but we need that. Uh, but she had to go through so much to get to that place. I mean, she was a great teacher. Mm -hmm. And that great teachers come from a great deal of pain that they decided to work through. And the more you work through your pain, the more of an educator you can be to other people. And I think that's, so that's true. an amazing legacy to encapsulate everything she did. She was educating. She was, whether, you know, okay, are people reading books or are they watching movies? Are they listening to poetry? Are they watching TV? You know what I mean? Like, what are the people doing? I want to help educate because I have learned some things that I find value in and other people have found value in it too. So let's spread the word. You know what I mean? <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. So, yes. Absolutely. So with that in mind, what did you learn from her? What was the, what was the personal takeaway uh, for this episode? Uh, for me, I feel like I have so much more to learn from her. Right. <laughs> like, what was the first lesson? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. This, <laughs> like I'm the like, pre-lesson. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> like, I feel like this is just the beginning for right. me. Um, oh, yeah. No, I'm with you. There's many people that, that we no. cover or that I found that it's like this initial pass of learning about a person is going to sit with me, but I can't wait till I come back and do a third, a fourth, a fifth pass and learn more and dig Absolutely. deeper. Yeah. Yeah. This is definitely Maya for me. I feel like I'm I'm avoiding. I know why the cage bird sings. Oh, it's a hard one. Because... Yeah. It's hard. It's very hard. I did one of my first long form films was about um, human trafficking and sexual abuse and that kind of thing. Yeah. The initial thing Maya has taught me is that it is that simple out of darkness. There comes a light. Right. You know, it's just that really simple like like that to me in my brain. That's one of the worst things that could happen to a person. And she came out strong like she is. I'm, she she's a pillar of American history, you know, mm -hmm. so it's like, oh, my goodness, like, I don't need to let this ruin me. I don't need to stew and letting and thinking it's going to it will only ever ruin people like it's awful. But right. there is hope at the end. Like there's a there's actually a glimmer of hope at the end of this, you know, so it's like I think that's the biggest lesson that she's going to continue to teach me oh very much so yeah and it, it's probably it's um oh goodness and for me of what I learned from I have to go a little personal too I I have what psychologists refer to as abandonment issues and a lot of times I joke about it because I mean I joke about it because that makes it a little bit easier um right. but my mother got sick when I was very young and my father worked a lot so that's where my abandonment issues come from I have since learned that a lot of the choices that I make come out of a simple fear of being abandoned again. Mm. It's why I do certain things. And, you know, right or wrong, uh, justifiable or not, to be able to be mindful of it, you know what I mean? To, right. to just understand, to know better and to do better, basically. Right. So I always kind of go through where it's like, all right, is this an abandonment issue that's coming up? Am I just reacting out of fear? 
or am I reacting out of logic? You know, and I just kind of check myself a little bit. Right. Um, and I bring this up because as I was learning more and more about Maya, I saw, and again, this is through my own filter of experiences because you can only really see through what you've experienced and what, you know what I mean, your perceptions are. But Absolutely. I saw from her a, a path to rectify abandonment issues. You know, mm-hmm. she was trying to learn about the world around her and the people around her. Um, she was really talking to people. She was really listening to people. Um, she was around those who were more gifted and experienced um, than herself. And she found ways, multiple ways to express herself. Mm-hmm. And she put into the world encouragement and education and she challenged people she really did challenge people and you know mostly using your voice to show that there is strength in vulnerability and that's part of like the abandonment dynamic you know what I mean it's it's vulnerable but at the same time it created your strength so it's a yin and yang it's a both sides of the coin you can't have one without the other um but really allowing yourself to see another human being um, is is something that I really learned from her. Not the icon, not the person on a pedestal, but the the real spirit, the real educator, that real hurt, that real wisdom, and that empathy. Um, I think that Dr. Angelou is an absolute fantastic teacher of mm-hmm. empathy. And I think that's, you know, in all of her books, in all of her poetry, in all of her speeches, she's really, really working towards get better at empathy, y'all. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) And I think that's a really, you know, um, uh, it's an important lesson for all of us. But I, I, I took it as she worked through her abandonment issues to get her to empathy. And so I love that path. Yeah, so absolutely. I'm going to, I'm going to keep working on that. <laughs> I love it. Gotcha. Uh, there is a lot more to Maya's wonderful, wonderful life. And we highly oh, yes. recommend you learning more about her, um, to check out the projects that she did, including her books and documentaries, uh, movies that she directed and wrote. Please, please learn more and more and more and more until then. Here's a quote from Maya Angelou. Each time a woman stands up for herself without knowing it possibly, without claiming it, she stands up for all women. For more information about this week's gal, visit galsguide.org. To support the show, visit the Gals Guide Patreon page. Thank you so much for subscribing and listening to Your Gal Friday. 